What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the My Other Passion Podcast. I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief of Front Office Sports, and today we have a special guest, Brian Moriarty. He is the Chief Creative Officer of Funko. He was a CEO for a long time. In fact, he acquired the company in 2005, and he is widely credited with taking Funko to the next level, aggressively pursuing all those licenses and partnerships with Disney and Star Wars and LeBron James and everyone else you can think of that has made it the billion-dollar powerhouse that it is today. We talked a lot about his plan with pop culture in general of course we talked about his plans with sports and athletes and they do have a lot of them and part of that is because rich paul the bronze agent good friend he just joined the board he was also part of an investment group alongside bob Iger, the churning group who are making this big bet that funko is going to be one of the largest pop culture companies of the future so let's go ahead and get into the conversation but first a quick message from our sponsors at netsuite If you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. That's true when your business is growing fast, and that's even more true when there's a lot of uncertainty. Inflation is running rampant, supply chains are clogged, the labor market is tight. What does that mean for margins? Well, not every business is in the dark because over 31,000 businesses know everything about their numbers. That's because they use NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite's going to give you visibility and control over your financials, planning, budgeting, inventory, everything you need to manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve those margins. NetSuite's going to help you identify rising costs. It's going to take all those manual business processes and let you automate them. It's also going to just help you see where to save money. Know your numbers, know your business, and get to know how NetSuite can be the source of truth for your entire company. Right now, you're in luck because NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. All you have to do is head to netsuite.com slash myotherpassion to make it happen. netsuite.com slash myotherpassion. Go right now. I can't recommend it enough. Everything about your business is going to change overnight. You heard it here first. Now back to the conversation. Brian Mariotti, welcome to the My Other Passion podcast. How are you doing today? Doing good, my friend. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. I, I think you're out in New York, right? I am. We are uh, out in New York for our first ever investor day, so pretty exciting. Okay, so tell me what, what comes along with that. What, uh, what are you hoping to accomplish at this investor day? I think, you know, for us, it was a little bit about some uh, the press event. Specifically, we just got done finished uh, completing was about some announcements that we hadn't made before. Uh, the biggest one, which I was lucky enough to announce, is um, our partnership with Snoop Dogg. We're doing a, a collab uh, out of Inglewood with a Snoop Dogg meets Funko store called The Dog House. Super exciting because it's only, uh, it's right across the street from SoFi, the $5 billion stadium that is built in Inglewood for the Rams and the Chargers. Um, and the idea of that store is a flagship store for everything that is music and sports. And the idea that we could take about 35 to 40 percent of the floor space on a given week and turn it into something specific for either a big music event or concert at SoFi or the latest Charge or Raider game. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, the idea that Snoop, Snoop and his wonderful brand wanted to you know, associate with us and, and do this partnership was also pretty exciting. So for me, that was the highlight of this event It's sharing some new information. But definitely that was the big one. Yeah, Snoop is all over cutting edge whether it's the nfts or funko i mean his his team does a really good job so i'm not surprised to hear that you're working together i'm in la so i've been out to sofi a number of times how are you working with the rams and the chargers i understand you have the shop but what are you doing with the rams and the chargers uh to achieve both of your business goals when it comes to you know merch and collectibles well, I mean, just me personally, I don't want anything to do with the Rams. I'm, I am a San Diego Charger fan, uh, now LA Charger fan. I grew up in San Diego, so that is my team. Uh, and myself personally, I got a chance to interview Justin Herbert, the best quarterback in the NFL, uh, for the best team in the NFL, the San, uh, LA Chargers, um, at our, our, our Funko Hollywood flagship store. It's a 44,000 square foot store in Hollywood that is all about pop culture. There's Star Wars lands and Marvel lands and Harry Potter lands and DC Comics lands and there's a huge sports section with a massive Michael Jordan statue. And so, um, you know, we have all the brands, uh, we have all the leagues, uh, we do have NFL and NFL PA, Major League Baseball and their players, uh, NBA and their players, Premier League, we have um, UFC, we have WWE. So we, we are all about sports and whether it's uh, 
the best quarterback in the NFL, like Justin Herbert, or some of the great icons uh, of past years, whether it's uh, LaDainian Tomlinson of the Chargers or Walter Payton of the Bears or, you know, uh, George Hallis of the Packers. We have everything that is um, sports and, and legends in sports, and that includes Muhammad Ali and Tiger Woods and, and Michael Jordan and, and their brand. So uh, it's been a big, um, you know, focus for us the last couple of years is, is, is engaging with that sports fan through a couple of different ways. And uh, for us, it's about creating exclusive content uh, for specific retailers to do really, really well in sports like eBay, which is our new partner. Um, Rich Paul is one of our new investors along with Bob Iger and the churning group. Um, and they came along and Rich obviously is one of the most powerful guys in all of sports and LeBron's agent amongst a bunch of other agents. And um, I, we're excited about having Rich on board as board of directors and his ability to get us directly to the athlete so we can start doing collabs of what these amazing athletes love in pop culture. And there's a lot of similarities between world-class athletes and what they love or admire in, in sport, uh, in, in pop culture. So we expect to see a lot of really high level, high elite athletes doing pop culture collabs with us in the near future. A lot of that credit's going to go to, to Rich coming on board and investing in Funko. How do you find that the athletes respond to Funkos? Um, we, like you say, you mentioned a number of names and yeah. there's Ali, there's Jordan, there's LeBron, there's like most of the stars that you can imagine. Uh, but any cool stories or anecdotes from connecting with one of those athletes and understanding their perception of getting one of these, you know, extremely popular toys? Yeah, I, I think it's, it, we, we continue to be amazed at like the athletes we talk to, they have small collections of, of Funko Pops, whether it's LeBron or, or, or Justin Herbert or um, WWE, WWE guys that have like walls of Funko Pops. Um, I think it's because we're one of the few companies doing sports figures. Uh, you know, 52% of our demographic are female and they're buying the products for themselves, not for their kids. They're adults age, you know, average age is 35. You know, a woman doesn't want to buy a Tom Brady action figure with 12 points of articulation, but they'll buy a cute Funko Tom Brady pop. And so that's been our gateway into women collecting sports and in pop culture. But we're seeing it with, with, with uh, the male population as well, as long as uh, with all these athletes. But we also see great guys. Uh, the NBA is the best example of this customized sneakers where you see like Luka Doncic and Dragon Ball Z or Carl Anthony Towns from the, the Timberwolves with like, his, his affinity for like horror. And I think that that's what's exciting about us and these athletes is that they love and absorb pop culture just like we do as fans whether it's movies or tv shows they binge or video games or anime there is that connection it's something that they're passionate about in addition to their own sport so there's just a natural synergy between what we're doing uh with pop culture and these world-class athletes yeah exactly it's like all the nba players now and really across sports it's i see guys who are into comics they're into like you said anime manga video games um and so you all certainly have a lot of choices for them there. But being that you are the chief creative officer, CEO for a long time, like so intimately familiar with the inner workings of these deals, do you ever have a conversation with a Tom Brady or a Michael Jordan about their product, about their design, um, and hear any type of feedback from them? Yeah, absolutely do. I mean, with Michael Jordan, for example, um, Michael likes to look at the new formats, but he never, he, he wants to make sure that he thinks the format is um, uh, well received in the marketplace. Uh, gold, he just came on, our, one of our new uh, sports initiatives has been this new figure line. It's aimed at mostly sports and music fans. It's got a def different demographic than the Funko Pops. They're a little more sleek and more urban in style. We're going after the guy that's on GOAT or StockX. It's a sneakerhead or a, a super hyper, you know, focused uh, sports fan. And, uh, you know, Michael loved the aesthetic, but he wanted to make sure that the line got into retail and, and he wanted to see it produced. He wanted to see what athletes were on board. And we launched with like LeBron and, 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 and Justin and, uh, and just a bunch of, you know, world-class athletes, you know, maybe from like, you know, like I said, Walter Payton to Deion Sanders to, um, you know, uh, John seen, Moran, even, the, you know? Yeah, even like the new guys, yeah, John Moran, Jason yeah. Tatum. Yeah. Um, yeah. Totally. 
so yeah, so having those guys on there. So then Michael saw that, saw that you know we had great success, and guys were tweeting um, their 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 figures on on their Instagram accounts and stuff. And and then Michael was on board, and he'll be part of the, the new uh, the new gold line coming forward. So to see that somebody is interested is taking the time to look at the designs, to comment, um, the ability to put in you know Michael example uh, with. Yeah, University of North Carolina and put him in his uh, Tar Heel gear uh, it is pretty cool and pretty important for him and, and for us. He loves that that North Carolina legacy. So um, talking with these guys, I think with the Justin Herbert uh, interview, I got to uh, show Justin his gold figure for the first time ever. He'd been a pop. He saw all these other gold figures in the NFL and didn't, didn't have one himself. And I, we got to show him live. Um, unveiling that that gold figure for him for the first time ever he was super excited so uh these athletes want to see uh these figures come out of them they get they get super excited they love the the, the jersey variants and the limitedness in nature and and uh so we're going to continue to feed that beast with uh all these great relationships we have with these athletes in these leagues yeah i love it i um i keep asking but i'm just so curious because your reach is so serious when it comes to pop culture like is there a conversation that you remember like i know that you are individually involved with everything that's coming out of funko so is there a conversation that you remember that just is like wow for the rest of my life i can say this world-class athlete we spoke yeah. about this creative yeah so you know it was funny we got to talk to ralph and Nadal, and, and uh, i'm a huge tennis fan and so uh, obviously ralph is Arguably the greatest tennis player in the world. Uh, has the most majors at 22, one ahead of uh, Djokovic and two ahead of Roger Federer. But to sit down with him and his people and talk about our foray into tennis and, and how we wanted to bring Rafa in to uh, be the first ever tennis pop. Um, for me as a tennis fan, um, uh, to meet and, and talk to him and his people and, and, and present that, that vision um, and then we got Roger Federer to come along and, and, and John Macro and Bjorn Borg and, and, and Venus Williams. And, and it's been just, uh, I mean, for me, it's like a dream come true. I mean, I bought the company back in 2005. And if you would have told me at some point, I'd be talking to the greatest tennis player in the world and talking about how we want to bring him into a pop. And, you know, that, that, that's a personal story that I, I um, will never forget. Uh, there's others like in music, uh, you know, Kurt Hammond at Metallica, I've been a Metallica fan forever, handed me one of uh, one of his guitars that he had signed at Comic-Con at our party in front of our, our, our rabid fan base of 1500. And uh, that party is the biggest party in San Diego Comic-Con. That's the biggest venue we have is 1500 people. But I think 47,000 people signed up for our party this year and only 1500 people can get to attend. So it just shows that how, um, you know, these connections with, with these world-class athletes or musicians mean so much to them as well. But like to, to, to have those kind of experiences, whether Robert Downey Jr. on the, the Iron Man 2 set was another just like kind of pinch me moment. Like, oh my God, I'm, I'm talking to Robert Downey Jr. and uh, on, on that movie set and, and how excited they are. I mean, Robert Downey Jr. is like a kid. He loves the Funko Pops. He loves the toys. John Favreau on the set of The Mandalorian. These are things that, that I will never forget uh, because, I mean, I bought this company because I'm a pop culture junkie in, in no way, shape or form. When I, I bought it in 2005, I never think I'd be interacting with anybody uh, other than, you know, our fan base. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's meant a lot to me. But, it, you know, that idea of constantly wanting to, to you know, bring out the best in, in these amazing, iconic uh people or, or characters on in TV uh, sitcoms or shows or, or theatrical movies is pretty exciting. Yeah, why don't we, well, one, I'm a fellow pop culture junkie, so we can relate on that. Like, you, you strike me as the type of guy where, you know, you can call this movie came out this year and it made this much at the box office and then this came out as a result of it and just getting up into the history of everything. You know, I saw uh, some videos of, of one of your homes and, you know, just seeing all the Hannah Barber stuff from the sixties. And it's just like, it's such a rich history and it can tell you a lot about, I think society in a broader sense. That's why it's not just like trivial pop culture stuff. You get to learn yeah. about, it's almost like sociological, right? <laughs> um, so I'm right there with you. Um, but why don't you 
tell us about, I guess, exploring all of these different partnerships. Like you, as you mentioned, you bought the company in 2005 and you are, you know, I'll just say it, like you are widely considered to be responsible for making the company what it is today. I know it's a big team, a lot of people, but you're the one who pursued, aggressively pursued all of the licensing and all the partnerships. Um, how did you how do you get out there and make that happen? You know, this, this place starts out doing Bob's big boy, which I'm in, I'm down the street from the one in Burbank, by the way. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about, but, but how do you go from, Hey, I'm, I'm starting this company. I like collectibles. So I'm working with Disney. I'm working with NFL. I'm working with star Wars. I'm like all over the map. Was it just like grittily getting in and building relationships? Um, did it take a lot of time or were people receptive immediately? How did that go? You know, I think the thesis I had when I bought the company was that as a fan, I was seeing things that I loved never being made into products. And I, that that was something that I always thought like somebody out there could start a company and and do that better and not necessarily do spreadsheet analysis on every product to every brand to see if it made enough money, but connect fans to things they love. And so... You know, I'll just one example that my 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 team hates, but I love is I'm addicted to Scott Pilgrim versus the world. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. And I could not wait to make everything I possibly could with Scott Pilgrim. We did cereal, we did soda figures, we've done uh Pez, we've done Pops, we've done all these other formats. And and I I, I know there's a, a diehard rabid fan of Scott Pilgrim, but I also know there's a diehard rabbit fan of American Psycho with Christian Bale. And, and I wanna see fans have something for that. I mean, I love um, all the the, uh, the movies like Hot Fuzz and Shaun of the Dead and, and um, seeing great directors uh, bring great movies to life. Denny Villeneuve, when he did the, the remake of Dune, I couldn't be any more excited because I was a huge fan of Arrival and Sicario, two of the best movies I've seen in the last uh, decade. And so I knew he was going to do justice to that, that movie. And, and Denny gr grew up as an absolute fan of the books. And so you knew he was going to pour his heart into the new Dune movie. And, and so for me, it's just always been about how do I monetize fandom? And that's the business philosophy. But as the geek, as the fan, is how do I bring cool, fun, whimsical products to fans on categories or products that... that other companies wouldn't dare do. And, and I think we were the first one to license Golden Girls, first one to license Bob Ross. Um, we, we go out there on limbs and we do things. First one to have, you know, Squid Game's product into the market. Um, and I've seen like, ones in friends' houses that I'm like, they make something for this? Like this movie yeah, just exactly. came out or that was really popular 40 years ago. And yeah. lo and behold, it's on their, their dresser or their shelf. Yeah, and that, that's important. I mean, like for me as a music fan, I mean, I you know, I, I wanted Morrissey of the Smiths, my favorite band of the Smiths, and you know, no one's ever making Smiths anything, right? And I wanted to make you know Morrissey my my favorite singer from the Smiths, and and, and so I think the idea that whether you're a fan of, of music or sports or uh, cooking, uh, we've done uh, Guy Fieri is 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 a, a Funko Pop, and in the chef line, we've done comedians like Fluffy Iglesias and and Joe Coy that have huge fan bases and followings. Uh, you know, we want to work with Richard Pryor and Eddie Murphy to bring back some of the most iconic comedians that I grew up with. I mean, you gotta have the watch. leather. You, you got to have the Eddie leather from Raw, yeah, right? Absolutely, yeah. I remember growing up watching that, my jaw dropping with Eddie Murphy, just going, oh my God, this is the most hilarious thing I've ever heard in my life. And praying my mom and dad would like maybe turn it off because it was so uh, not rated PG, right? So, um, yeah, so I, I, I just thought that was it. And luckily, um, you know, we, we created a format with Pop in 2010. It took us a while to find that perfect format. Um, we tried a lot. A lot of it didn't work. A lot of it were just like singles and some were broken bat singles. But we had some success to keep the company afloat. Pop came on, along. And, you know, when I had that opportunity to, to create that aesthetic and, and name it Pop, I, I was so sure that, um, we were bringing new people into our fan base, and the, the most rapid uh, evidence was at San Diego Comic Con in 2010 when we introduced Pop. Most of our original fan base hated it, but women were coming into our booth saying, "Oh, I want one of those cute Batman's or those cute Jokers." 
and I knew we had something there. So I basically emptied out my savings account and signed every license I could knowing I had the platform with pop to bring men and women, boys and girls into pop culture. They would allow me to lever all these amazing licenses. And we have the best licensing department in the world. We have the most licenses in the world of any company um, at 1100 licenses. And that allows us to connect all those individual licenses to their fandoms. And that's what's so exciting. And I think the thing I'm most proud about is no matter what it is, Funko is going to try to find a way to do it and bring those that joy to that fan base. So that was a product of really expending expenditures and, and spending money rather than like, I, I'm curious about how it actually happens, how this company that's somewhat obscure all of a sudden is aligned with like every major or even minor property in the world. Seemingly like, do you just have yeah. to get on the phone and, and call up everybody you can and let them know, yeah. Hey, I have a check for you if you want to do this. Yeah. I mean, it was pretty much that. I mean, I would cold call um, just about every licensor that we weren't working with and try to find a way to work with them or afford the ability to work with them. Um, the funniest story of all of that is, as I was doing that, I was handling licensing myself and a lot of the creative you know, vision of the company in terms of what products and how we're gonna name it, what demographic we're going after. Um, and working with our world-class artists to kind of bring these things to life. Um, I got a call from uh, a guy that claimed he was from Lucas Films. Uh, this is probably about 2007, 2008. This British guy gets on saying that, you know, he runs Star Wars uh, licensing and wants to sign us up um, as a licensee. And I kept on saying, I know this has got to be one of my friends effing with me, right? There's no way that this, this is who you say you are. And I just kept on going on for a couple of minutes. And I was absolutely convinced this guy, no way would a guy from Lucasfilms pick up this, pick up a phone and call, cold call me and say he wanted to do a, a deal with us. Um, and so he was actually had to send an email to my email from Lucas Jones before I believed him. And, and we got, we talked for about a half an hour. I, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. And uh, that came across during the conversation. He goes, congratulations. I said, look, I, I so desperately want to do this deal, but I just don't think I have the money to sign a Lucas Jones deal. And he said, don't worry about this. Congratulations. You're going to sign the least expensive Lucas Jones deal ever. Um, I really want to work with you guys. And I, I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. Um, he almost hung up on me because I refused to believe it was him. Uh, Paul Southern uh, still runs Lucas Films to this day. I still occasionally remind him of that phone call. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, most of it was me just digging in and doing a lot of work. Um, one of my best licensors was this lady, Dolly, who ran um, licensing out of Disney for us. And, and once I realized how great she was in this space, I brought her on to build this world-class licensing team and credit goes to her and her team because they, they have, they've brought this licensing thing into uh, the modern times, uh, much more sophisticated when I was doing it, but to, 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 to have 1100 unique contracts and to be able to manage that on a day-to-day -day basis is a staggering uh, amount of work and, and, and a job so well done from that team. And they really are the magic to our brand because it really does. Everybody in the pop culture world knows that Funko will come out with something that's having a moment or the nostalgia that they grew up loving. And so uh, that delicate balance has been amazing. And, and we continue to think it's the life, right, the, the life, the life force that kind of brings this company uh, to the front. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, my kids, my daughter's sick. She has um, Raya and the last dragon as well yep. as uh, some Pokemon ones like on her shelf. Yeah. So um, wide, wide range of interests there. You know, I'm, I'm really fascinated. This comment you said about empty, emptying out your savings account. Um, I don't know if it's far removed enough that you'd be comfortable sharing that only because in pop culture, there's all these like classic stories, right? Kanye, I spent 40 million of my own money to make my shoes or whatever, right? There's, there's certain classic stories or, or sometimes with filmmakers, right? Spielberg and George Lucas and that whole crew type putting up their own money to make stuff happen. What is, what does that look like? Did you drop like million dollars or something just to, just to get things going or several, like. I, I, I did not, I did not have a million dollars to drop. Uh, it was um, pretty much a good chunk of my, uh, of my, 
life savings went into acquiring Funko. Um, and um, it, was, it, was, it was a company that was around for six years before I bought it. And I was a fan. I, 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 they were a small bobblehead company run by a husband and wife. Uh, that guy, Mike Becker, still works for us today. He's a senior VP of, of creative and head, runs all of our events. And he's an amazing individual. But I, I bought him out with that premise of like taking pop culture to the masses and, and tying them in. But they were just a small bobblehead company, and I just collected their products. But that was a big that was a big chunk of of my life savings. I, I did uh, I designed and developed restaurants and nightclubs uh, for a guy that I worked for right out of college, and uh, I loved that. I did it for ten years. Met my wife, um, and. Uh, in that space, she was our food rep. And then once I, once I got married, uh, my wife was like, you really can't be in the nightclub industry being married for so many different reasons. I don't really want to say on this podcast, uh, but I got that. And so that was what I did. I said, all right, well, let's go buy Funko. Um, so yeah, I mean, a, a big chunk came out of that and a big chunk, basically, I think it was the last $100,000 of my savings account pretty much went into this like monetization of all these licenses that I needed to explore with, with pop because we weren't really making a lot of money back then the first five years. We just kind of were enough to pay the payroll, uh, have a little bit of money in the bank and we were growing, but only just by a little, by a little bit each and every year. And so that opportunity was just, just there. And I knew that if I didn't, um, if I didn't take it to its fullest extent, uh, I would regret it. And, 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 and so, that investment um, uh, was something that we just, I knew what we had to make and and um, we did it and I'm glad we did it. And I, I try not to do anything half-ass, uh, we go all in. And, you know, I think that's why I'm still around now. I mean, I, I've been doing this for, you know, as CEO, 17 years, I handed that range over to Andrew this year. It's been my partner as, as my president for the last seven years preceding that. But, um, I, I just want to do the, the fun things, which is the licenses, the retail relationships, the fan relationships, the creative ideas and how to grow the brand and the vision of the company uh, and, and not do the things I'm not good at. I don't know if I was a particularly good CEO. Uh, there's a lot of things that I have limitations on, but I know these are my strengths that I'm playing into now. And this idea of us not living up to our potential as a company is what keeps me up at night. And I know we have a chance to be the most dominant pop culture company on the planet, but I say that in the most fun way. It's just making cooler stuff for the fans. And that's why we bought Mondo because I love music. I want to get into vinyl records and art posters and high-end collectibles and why we bought Loungefly because I wanted to see my daughter, you know, wear the coolest Pokemon backpack ever. She loves Pokemon. So those kind of things, are, as we continue to acquire companies, we look for small brand leaders that we know we can put into the Funko flywheel and use our world-class set of licenses and distribution and testing and sourcing and fulfillment to, to help elevate those brands in categories we're not good at. And, and yet these brands we can grow. I think Loungefly is, you know, I think it's trailing 12 months as well over $200 million a year in the last 12 months. And, that company, when I bought it, was was twelve million dollars a year every year. The stock is up fifty eight percent past six months, uh, two hundred fifty three percent the last five years. Uh, it's pretty much the time since you all went public. Um, what is it like to have that type of business success? I can tell you have such like a pure hearted love for the pop culture, but what is it like to see those numbers and start driving that revenue? Um, you know, I, I try not to pay attention to it. Um, <laughs> We didn't have the greatest IPO. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the worst IPO in 17 years, we went public right after Toys R Us went bankrupt. People continue to still think we're a toy company. We're not, we're a pop culture company. And so it was difficult, but I think it kind of fueled everybody in our company to say, hey, man, we just got beat down on what should have been one of the coolest days ever taking a company public on NASDAQ. And it kind of fueled us. We just kind of keep our head down, kind of do our work and you know, the stock market's interesting, right? And I think that uh, there are times when you have a great quarter, last quarter, and our stock went down after a great quarter when no one's showing year over year growth. And, you know, we try to tell everybody the same thing. One, we're going to continue to invest in the future because we believe in the future. And, and two is there's no, there's, there's just increasing demand each and every year for our products. And, you know, we've grown every single year, except for when we got hit with the pandemic for the first half of, of, of 2020. And so, 
you know, I try not to look at that. I say, look, if we just do the things that we can do good, the end result is that we will we, we'll provide value for our shareholders. And I think that is, that's the ethos. We just keep our head down. We keep working. We keep building these partnerships with our retail partners and, and our licensing partners and our fans. And uh, it sounds boring, but if you can ignore that and just focus on the love and the passion that, that our company has as a whole for pop culture, we're going to be okay. And I think that is, um, like you said, your daughter and her love for like Pokemon or, or, or Raya the Last Dragon, um, our, our, our fan base keeps expanding. We're really getting a, a lot of like tween and, and teen fans. And that, that's something we've skewed a little, little bit younger than we have in, in past years. And I think that's because we're, we're consistent with everything, whether it's BTS or now we got Blackpink coming in. I mean, right. Blackpink might be one of the biggest bands in the world, right? It's just a different Dude, that, that thing is going to fly off the, oh, you yeah. know, those, those K-pop fan bases are no joke. Oh, but if yeah. uh, I love that philosophy and outlook when you, when you look at your stock price, you look at your revenue, you're focused on the culture in a lot of ways. I can see why you, why you went to chief creative officer and got out of the CEO <laughs> position. Um, but that said, you know, we're a business publication and we wrote about the churn and group investment. I mean, yeah. that's a huge number, you know, we don't have to get into the specifics. Yeah. What was published was the 263 million, 25%, but let's actually go past all of that. And we're talking about some of the most brilliant minds in pop culture, in their respective fields. You got Bob Iger, Rich Paul, you have eBay as an institution. Um, have you had any conversations with Rich Paul about the potential of this company and, you know, what has he said and what is he hoping to contribute as a member of yeah. the board? Rich, Rich wants to be an asset to us and he drew, generally loves what we're doing. I mean, he, he sat in on a board meeting that was eight hours long and he was on all eight hours for his board meeting. He was like, wow, you guys have some long ass board meetings. I'm like, yeah, we have some, we have some long board meetings. But he's fascinated. I mean, one thing that came out of it, um, that first board meeting for Rich was like, I really want to see Funko focus on collabs with world-class athletes and world-class musicians. And, I, and I, I couldn't be any more aligned with Rich's vision on that. And I think that's something we're excited about. I'd say right now as a brand, we're not really good at marketing ourselves, right? We're good at marketing to our fans. We're good about sending our fans to Walmart or Target or Amazon or any of our other partners. Or, or to our own website. I mean, we're, we are our number one customer, which we're very proud of. We're obsessed with our own D2C journey, and we're getting better and better at that. But but trumping the trumping the Funko brand and how much it, how cool it is and how how relevant it is in pop culture, we're we're not good at, and we're trying to become good at. Rich is going to add a lot to that. Trevor Williams, who ran marketing for Nike forever, sits on our board is going to help us do that. So we're excited to learn from Trevor and Rich on how to do that. I think, you know, one of the things I just mentioned today at press is, you know, Hallmark and Ferrero, the world's largest co car, uh, candy company, licensed from Funko, little old Funko. They license RIP. And those are amazing companies, way bigger than us, probably way better run than us. Um, and yet they turn to Funko, the Funko brand to connect the pop culture better. Uh, 1010 Games is doing, who did all the Lego uh, uh, video games with Lego Star Wars and Lego Marvel video games and Lego Potter, um, is doing a huge Funko uh, uh, AAA rated uh, video game. That, I that saw I know that. You got a platformer and you got a film oh, coming. Exactly. And so, so all these other companies seem to realize how cool our brand is. And so we got to get better at that. I think that's where Rich and, and for example, Rich and, and, and Trevor are going to really help us out. Bob. Man, I mean, Bob and Peter, man, they, they know this industry so well. And it's can you, whether can you tell me like yeah. a lesson you might get from a legend like Bob I Iger or Peter Jordan, yeah. like these guys have done so much to oh, yeah. contribute to how we view entertainment in general. And now you're working very closely with them. You know, any any advice that you got or just something that you saw that you were like, OK, this is going to help Funko because yeah, you know, they it's brought great. this in. Yeah, I mean, with Peter, I mean, Peter was in on every one of our, you know, basically early on meetings, right? He didn't have to be, you know, he, he runs his company, but he could have let, you know, lesser people, I guess, you know, in the organization kind of have those early on. Peter was in every meeting, you know, everything that was going on, somebody at his level that would take the time and hear 
our pitches. He'd ask really tough questions himself. Um, and to me, that was like, man, I mean, you know, this is his company and they wrote the biggest check they've ever had in the history of churning group. But for Peter to be in all those meetings and ask those questions and understand he didn't just rely on his lieutenants or his right hand people to do it. He was in the room and he'd put the work in. Um, same thing with Bob. Bob came to the Funko Hollywood store. He walked the store. He knew about us for years, obviously, with being a big earner at, at Disney Consumer Products. We had a firsthand kind of seat to what how Funko's grown from nothing to be one of the top three revenue producers for DCP. Um, but, you know, what I loved about Bob was, you know, Bob just got off of a, a going to Star Wars Celebration and in, in like it was June and was talking about, you know, how much he loved the Loungefly brand and how they represented themselves at that show and how excited he's been watching Loungefly get larger and larger. He also mentioned another company that's going to be one of the three acquisitions we will be making in addition to the Mondo that we just made in, in, in June. We got three more acquisitions that are right around the corner that we're about ready to announce. And Bob mentioned this other small company that had, a, again, a great brand name in a category that we do not play in and said, hey, you know, I like this company and I'm excited about you guys wanting to, to acquire this company. And here's what I love what they're doing. And so he is spending time with these emerging brands and lending his expertise on, you know, how he's seen them grow and how we think we can take them a lot further with, with everybody's help. Um, and, and so to watch these guys and then Bob just sent us an email and, and just said, Hey, how else can I help? Right. How else can I help? How do you want to utilize me? And so when Rich and Bob and Peter are like giving us their time, I mean, I always like, kind of like, Hey, I don't want to bug you. And they're like, nah, yeah. man, you're not bugging us. Right. We Is there anything like philosophical that you're like, yo, I'm going to think about this when I'm running my business because a legend like yeah. Bob Iger gave me some advice about how to view this. Yeah, Bob, Bob's obsessed with um, content, community, and commerce, right? The three C's, and, I, and, and we've taken that to heart. And um, I love that. I love that that's how he looks at the world. Um, and we see similarities. Uh, I, I, I think as, of us as like a, a young Disney like 30 years ago, right? Where, where that was something that was just starting to to realize how to put the content with the fans and then try to monetize it through commerce. And so that, that stuck in, in, in my head with Bob is that content commerce and community is such a big deal for him and it aligns with what we're doing, but to get better at that branding with that. And, and so, man, you just got to pinch yourself when you're with these guys, man. I mean, getting Rich's time or Peter's time or, or Bob's time or, I mean, just sitting with the CEO of eBay and talking about how we can help each other out as as um, as partners has been phenomenal. I mean, and it eBay, all started from the love. It all started from just it, genuine love for this. So, yeah. uh, being mindful of the time, I know you got to go. So, I got two more questions, yeah. and uh, and we can get out of here. Um, when you acquired the company, you bought the company in 2005. I read somewhere you said, you know. It wasn't for a lot of money. You come in, bootstrap, you make it happen. What is something that you couldn't have imagined, essentially? Because you, you buy a company because you have a vision. But yeah. what's the thing that happens? What are we looking at? We're, we're like, is it 17 years? Yeah, 2005. Yeah, uh, yeah, 17 years, yeah, going on 18, yeah. Uh, everyone, I think, in the 20s were trying to, like, I'm like, wait, isn't the 80s still 20 years ago? <laughs> like, you know, you have to readjust your framework. Yeah. Um, but what's the thing that surprised you that, like, it, you never in your wildest dreams could have quite imagined what happened when you bought this company? You know, I, it, it, I, I, would, I would go back to, I'll just say it as guys or companies that I grew up just idolizing or loving that Bob Iger would invest his own money, that Rich Paul would invest his own money, that eBay would invest their money in our brand, that Ferrero or Hallmark would, 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 would want to license us um, in our take on pop culture. Um, the 1010 Games, I, I think the most creative game house in the world, the way they write um, humor and storylines in the video game play is amazing to me. They showed us a demo 
I can't tell you what licenses they showed us, because but it was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. And they 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 cold called us and said, hey, we want to show you something. We're a video game company. We have an idea for you. And so we expected, okay, well we'll take the we'll take the meeting. And then they showed us like five minutes of gameplay with, and I'm like, um, how long have you guys been working on this? They said we've been working on this for nine months before they ever called us. And, and so That's I'm like, impressive. Oh. And 30, 30 people on that team had been working on this idea to pitch Funko. And so I think that's the thing that kind of was the aha moment was like, you know, that Charlie Denson said, you know, years ago, which is, hey, you can be this, a $2 billion company. And you just go down and you just do your work and you really don't pay attention to just do anything besides doing your work. But when those outside forces start to validate your company and your brand and, and, and our wonderful 1700 employees on a global basis they're so obsessed with pop culture they put their heart and their mind and their passion into every day when they show up to work um it like rings a bell like hey man do not underachieve here do not do not let a wonderful opportunity go away because the things we're doing aren't saving lives and but we're bringing joy to people and like some most of the time you know, ten dollars at a time right and i think right. That in weird times with pandemics and everything else that's been going on with this world, to someone to just get a little bit of joy at the cost of a burger and a Starbucks coffee um, <laughs> is pretty cool. And and so although it's nothing important and no one needs to have our products, thank God everybody wants our products, and that's a big distinction. Um, so I, I think that outside validation really was the thing I think that I was the most surprised about. That kind of just went wow. We're doing something right here as a company, right? And then with all this trajectory that you have, um, all this growth over the past you know, couple decades, you are now, I think, starting to turn it up with sports. You got Rich Paul on the board. You've worked with all these iconic athletes. Um, what can we look forward to with sports? Um, obviously, like you want to grow, but... But really, yeah. what do you think Funko's place is with this community? Because you said you're a big tennis fan. You have a yep. putting green in your backyard. Like, yep. you love sports. So yeah. where do you want to take it uh, as sports and Funko is concerned? Yeah, I, I think we want to partner up with great companies like eBay and Fanatics and ourselves, And we want to bring sports to a global fan base in a way they haven't seen it before. And I'll give you one example. Uh, you know, we, we acquired Motto because they're an industry leader in three categories, um, but they do the most gorgeous movie posters I've ever seen. They sell for 80 to 100 bucks. They're limited. They're printed with metallics and stuff like this. And I'm like, why haven't we seen a 2022 Golden State Warriors NBA championship poster or a 1966 San Diego Chargers or LA Chargers, um, you know, AFL championship or, or why haven't we seen a, a, a cool poster of like Lombardi and, and Lambeau Field? And, and I think that's one way um, Loungefly is doing amazing backpacks for men and women uh, that are elevated, that are better than anything we think is in the marketplace for sports teams and how to show their fandom in, in a fashion way. I think you're going to see a couple acquisitions we haven't announced yet, how they're going to play into the sports world. We want to bring great brands into the sports market in a way that's never been done before. And the same thing goes with music. We want to get, we want to elevate what a music fan would expect, um, not just a black concert teacher. We want to do high level products that celebrate fandom of music and sports that have never been done before. And I guarantee you we're going to do that. And having Rich and Trevor from Nike and Charlie from Nike and Bob and, and uh, Peter's connections are going to help us do that. We're going to work with world-class athletes and world-class musicians in ways that show their love of pop culture and ways to show great products for great sports teams and, and great athletes and musicians in a way that's never been shown before. So that was what our future is. And that's super exciting. And to have, you know, like guys like eBay and, and, and fanatics as partners in that, in regard, we're really excited about that. Yeah, it's a bright future, and I appreciate you telling me all about it. Did Fanatics offer to buy you all yet? Like they're buying everyone else? I mean, I'm a publicly traded company. I could never, ever, ever have any kind of conversations on anything like that. 
<laughs> of course. Well, look, we're gonna we're gonna keep our eyes out because it's yeah. been a great run. Uh, appreciate you being so open and and yeah. real with me. I love your story. I'm wishing you the best. And yeah, I grew up in Chicago, '96 Bulls. Like, I need that Jordan one on my shelf too. So I, I know we got Scotty Pippen. We got some great stuff. Yeah, I man. saw the Dennis Rodman. You guys got it covered. Uh, so rainbow hair, Dennis Rodman, man. It gets yes. still better than that. My favorite thing is the Slam magazine covers we're coming out with. You got Alan Iverson. Oh, so you got the Shaq one with the in the oh, AI fro. Yeah. Dude, oh. you all you all are doing you're doing it right. And I, I love the care and attention to detail and just the legitimate love for the culture and for the sport. Thank you. And I wish you the best. Thanks for hopping Thank on you, the podcast. Thanks for the great questions. Appreciate the time. That's a wrap on another episode of My Other Passion. I want to thank Brian for coming out and sharing all those great insights about what it took to make Funko the billion dollar company that it is today, about what it's like to work with iconic athletes like LeBron and Tom Brady and Michael Jordan and Rafa Nadal and licensing with Disney and DC and Star Wars and just the fact that he took a bet on himself and it paid off. I love hearing that. I hope you enjoy hearing it too. We'll be back next Wednesday with another guest, but until then, I'm out.